Hey guys, I'm Mark Howe and today this is the first part of a mini part series where I set out to make my very own milling machine vise. Now these vices are commercially available, yes you can buy them secondhand. I just, I, I had too many sold out from underneath me to the point where I decided I was just going to make my own. Um, luckily though, when I was searching for a cast iron weight, like a dumbbell weight to make a backing plate for my three-jaw chuck, I found someone with a foundry. So I called them up, I went to go see them, and hey, wouldn't you know it, they struck a deal with me, and they said they had an old German CNC, CNC engraver, really. Um, and if I could get that going for them, because I had made my own 3D printer, um, that they would cost me this vice for free. I just decided, though, that I wanted to try my hand at making patterns. Remember my whole plan of making aluminium, I want to make an aluminium lathe at some stage. I'm crazy like that. Anyway, um, I figured score because I could use the CNC to make the parts, but I needed to learn about that. And then luckily at the same time, work needed to make a CNC of their own for engraving our labels. So I was like, cool, let me use both to learn on and do this whole process. So I ended up building a Shapeoko clone, I fixed the, uh, the German machine, and then I used the large machine at work to cut out these really awesome patterns. And what I figured I could do, can you guys see me? Is that I would take these MDF patterns, these MDF cake slices, if you will, and I would stack them on top of each other to get the height that I needed because end mills in the quarter inch range which I had, no, one eighth range, sorry, um, they, they're not very long. I mean, it's an eighth inch end mill or they can't go very deep. So what I did is what a lot of people do in like the aerospace molding industry, you make cake slices. Now that was pretty cool um, because the first step, well, I guess I wanted to 3D print these, but these would have taken absolute hours to print and it really wasn't worth the time. Um, I learned a lot though, in Fusion 360, you have a small little 1 8 end mill digging away an adaptive clearing at this and it has to chomp up so much metal, <laughs> so much metal, so much MDF. And I realized, wouldn't it be cool if you could do a 2D contour and I would just come and I call it troughing, I would come in, make successive ramp cuts and I would make ramp cuts all the way in a 2D contour and I didn't have to clear away like a, a 10 or a 5 mil or 3 mil border around this thing and that saved me so much time because even with the CNC making these out of solid MDF, one part would take me like four hours to machine. So a significant amount of time went into machining these parts on that CNC. Um, and as you can see in one of the photos that I put up, um, we we didn't use a router. I wish we had had a router, 
but we literally used a, a rotary engraving tool, like a Dremel type thing. And that was good enough actually for all of you thinking that you need a proper full-size Makita or DeVault um, router on your CNC's, you really don't. You just have to play with your feeds and speeds. And I tell you, it'll work, it'll get you cutting, it'll get you going. Look at the size of this thing. I made this with a, a off-brand rotary tool. Now the other cool thing was, was that in the size, because I was getting this cost, I could make this as big as I freaking wanted. And I decided to copy the, um, the Kurt Anglock system, patent has expired, and I just think they're awesome vices. I cannot get them here. Um, and I had to solve some interesting problems that way. I had to figure out how Kurt got the inside details and managed to pull the vise out of the actual part. That was a real big challenge. I figured out why Kurt vices have the funny little holes on the side. No, they're not for weight reduction. <laughs> no, they're not to have less cost, iron to cost. It's nice, but that's not the reason. Um, yeah, and, and there's a lot of exciting things that Kurt did, and I, I'm a little bit Oh, it's the Asian in me, sorry, um, not politically correct. It's the Asian in me that is able to look at a device and make same. Make same, make same. Now I'm fully aware that anyone can go and do what I did. And yes, the patent has expired. It's public knowledge. I admire Kurt. I just cannot, cannot get a vice in this country for anything less than two arms and two legs. And even the Chinese clones, I can't get imported to this country. The shipping is the price of a, a commercially available vice here. So I really had very little choice other than to find a scrapped out vice or to make my own. Um, would I do it again? I have the pattern now, so yes, I maybe would, I maybe wouldn't. What took the longest out of this whole process was the finishing. Um, honestly, each one of these pieces, as giant as it was, with a 1 8 end mold, took me 4 hours and I had to do, this is, the reason this is still here is because it's part of, um, it was a scrap. I, I mocked it up on the, the vise, uh, on the mill, and I had little blocks and a piece of stock and it was to scale, which is lovely, and it made me realize I had to go remake all the parts I had made already. Um, and through it all, there was a lot of experimenting to do, like how best to finish the MDF so it wouldn't swell, how you could actually use it as a, a, a casting method. Um, I had to learn a lot about like finishing these fillets and I used wood sander in here to get all these sharp fillets to be suitable for um, casting. I had to come back and adjust some of my draft angles on the main vice body. That um, needed a lot of work. And then gluing them together, painting them, getting them dimensionally accurate. Honestly, if I had to do this again, I would not use MDF. But for first time patent making, until you know what you're doing, MDF is great. It's cheap, it's affordable, um, it's lovely to work with. You can sort, you can mill it, you can, there's, you can adjust your designs once you've done that. That is great for MDF. Um, what else? What else? What else? Yeah, and finishing. Um, so for finishing, I used a mixture of Bondo, um, car sealer, and lots of wood fill. I found that the wood sealer, once you added a polyurethane, um, polyurethane uh, sealer, like a sanding sealer on top of it, was great. Now, when you are using the Bondo, it's great, it's hard, it's it's workable, but the sanding sealer and the MDF work better. So MDF parts and molds, use wood sanding sealer, That's use wood filler, that's perfectly fine. I'm trying to think what else I want to tell you guys. Um, yeah, I had to learn to use plaster of Paris to make the core, because not only did I have to make the actual positive shape, I then had to make the negative to make the positive to make the negative casting can really turn your mind upside down in terms of how everything goes together and how you're actually going to get your parts out. So if you're going to do this, spend a lot of time thinking about how you're going to extricate your parts from the actual sand um, and save yourself a lot of trouble that way because it's all good and well thinking, yeah, no, I'll make this awesome, epic, complicated part, but really getting your pattern out of the the sand again is really one of the biggest challenges i found figuring out 
how to do that. Um, other things that I still have to solve is how on earth I am going to get an Acme left hand lead screw. Um, but then again, I mean, the Kurt Weisses use like a, a three quarter nine TPI unified national coarse thread, like a, a standard thread. So maybe I'll just do that as well in left hand. Um, but yeah, guys, so that's been a few of the questions and answers. Um, and I've got a few of the other tips that are going to be coming in. I hope you watch along with the series. It has been a real big learning experience for me. I have learned so much. I have lost and gained so much. Please enjoy the rest of the footage. Please enjoy the rest of the series. That's Mark Howe with this little intro. Out. Thank you.